okay? Um, so, uh, <coughs> all the way through the Bible, there's really, a, 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 if you like, a snapshot of, of things that happen. We don't get the whole story. I mean, this, this uh, probably took some time to actually travel these distances. And sometimes whenever they stop somewhere, all you get is just a glimpse. And then they shoot on, don't even tell you hardly anything about the place. Uh, and that's what we've got here in this mystery journey, as is in some of the other situations. Uh, a little bit later on in this chapter, we're going to see uh, the Apostle Paul and the rest of them climbing over a bunch of mountains. And all it, all it says is they crossed over. And yet the distance involved is phenomenal. And when we come near the end of the chapter, I'll, I'll give you the mileage in a way, uh, they travelled on the way back. Um, but anyway, so this, uh, this situation, the two of them, two of them talk about Barnabas and, and Saul. Uh, and Barnabas, as we said last week, is up to this point seen as a, a, almost like a mentor or certainly the person who has been more in the forefront of things. But as this chapter progresses, you're going to see the switch take place where Paul becomes more the ones mentioned first, and Barnabas is almost <coughs> taking a, a, a second seat compared with Apostle Paul. So uh, there's a lot of things going to change here. It's a big picture has changed from Peter and the first uh, uh, number of chapters of the, the book of Acts, and now we're moving on to the wider Gentile world, <coughs> which was Paul's uh, remit if you will, to take a message to the gospel of the Gentiles, and that's where we see opening up from here. Remember what Jesus said, the gospel would begin from Jerusalem, and we saw that in Acts chapter 2, uh, to Samaria, uh, and into the uttermost part of the earth, and this is the beginning of the uttermost part of the earth. By the time Paul comes to write uh, Colossians, chapter 1, verse 22 and 23 there, um, the, the statement said, the gospel is going out into all the world. I actually, heard, I actually heard on Sunday, we talked about conflict yeah. on Sunday, and um, my vicar said that um, he brought up and he said, you know, in, in Acts, it seems as though everybody got on all great together, you know, all the apostles and the disciples and everybody, all, they all loved each other and everything. He said, but there was quite a bit of conflict between Barnabas and, and Paul. At times, they, they, you know, they, they didn't, they, they look in the thing as though they actually... <coughs> the biggest part of the conflict yeah. is probably referring to comes later on in this chapter, oh, when, when so uh, Mark, yeah. Mark decides to go home. And, uh, and, and, more, more or less, Paul comes in and says, well, that's it, you know, I'll give him a chance, uh, you know, and, and I'm not going to, I'm going to take him with me again. But in essence, he, later on, in, in one of his other letters, he turns mm -hmm. around and Mark's there, they're, they're back, to, back to friends again. But it certainly did cause a little bit of conflict between Barnabas and... Because and, right. and Barnabas, uh, when you think about it, lived up to his name, being the encourager. He was the one who encouraged Paul, uh, or Saul, as he was, after his conversion in chapter 10, uh, and to, to in, uh, introduce him, if you like, to, to the congregations. Uh, so he was there for him when others were against him. You were yeah, looking for him, actually. Yes, you were looking for him. So he was very instrumental in the underdog, Saul, who would have been at that time, and you see him here, almost in the same role. He's the one who's the, the peacemaker, the, uh, who's making the, the little bit of peace between uh, John Mark and, and, and Paul, and saying, you know, don't, don't just write them off yet, because he's got good stuff in him, probably. That's and he's my nephew, anyway. Well, that helps. <laughs> who's your nephew? Uh, Barnabas. John Mark was Barnabas, Barnabas nephew. nephew. All right, all right. So uh, there's a little bit of, you know, this is what I'm saying. Quite often in the text, we don't get all the all the ins and outs. We're just going to pick up the picture as it goes along. But it's certainly true uh, when you consider, uh, and actually, and actually uh, when Ananias and Sapphira, when they got when they got killed by the Holy Spirit, I mean, uh, they were they were out to be making a name for themselves in the church. And sometimes it is true that if, if we have some conflict in the church today, we look back into the book of Acts and, and other uh, letters of the New Testament and think, well, you know, they had, it, they had it rosy compared with us, and we have a little bit of friction here and there, and we think, well, you know, I know we shouldn't have, but we do. But yet, when you think about it, most of the New Testament was written to deal with problems. Practically all letters Paul ever wrote. He was dealing with, he, he starts off with encouraging a congregation, but he then he goes on to say, but, you know, you've got a few problems here, let me help you sort them out. And we wouldn't have half the New Testament, it wasn't that the church had problems in the first century. So, so uh, it's a rosy picture to think that uh, uh, the New Testament is a picture of, of uh, everything going well for everybody. Because that just, when you deal with human beings, it, it just doesn't work that way. No. Human beings are, are human beings. 
Uh, and somebody once said the church you would find was working for the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> that's that's the the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so there is that a, a, a thing. But having said that, there must have been certainly enough of a harmony going on. Um, if, if you missed it, last week when we talked about chapter verses 1 to 3, you saw that the church set aside, through the Holy Spirit set aside Paul and the Barnabas for this, and they laid hands on them, not for them to receive a gift, but to, to show that they were happy for these two men to undertake this journey. So the church was behind this group of people as they went off and did this job. Uh, and, and that's a good thing. And also, in that verse you missed last week, the Gentile churches, like Antioch and others, had donated a lot of money because the church in Jerusalem had a famine. They, they, not just the church, but the whole area was having a famine. And, and the Gentile Christians responded to the need. So, in one sense you have a conflict, but in the other sense, the other side of the coin is, you saw a lot of, a lot of harmony. Mm -hmm. Here were Jews and Gentiles who, before Christianity, would have given, given each other the time of day. Matter of fact, they would have spat in each other's eyes. They, you know, uh, certainly the, the, uh, uh, the, the Gentiles used to, uh, well, the Jews used to walk up the outside of Samaria because they wouldn't even go close to the people in Samaria. So there was all sorts of uh, uh, barriers, uh, ethnic barriers that were in existence. Then Christianity came in, and a lot of them went out the window. And Jesus did obviously a great job in breaking down some of that. Because you remember in John chapter 4, with a woman by the well, A, she was a woman, and here it was a man talking to a woman, uh, and B, uh, she was a Samaritan, count num number two against her. Three, she'd been divorced, uh, they, 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 it was, she was on her fifth husband. There should be another count against her as far as the Jews are concerned. Jesus broke down every one of those barriers in communicating with this woman. Uh, and the impact was seen by the, uh, the effect in John chapter 4 in her own town. And she wouldn't be popular in her own town. She'd be looked on by, down on by her own people. And Jesus was just driving a wedge through the the human barriers that we often put up around ourselves. So he, was, he still is our greatest example on allowing ourselves to communicate with people and get on with people, despite our differences in background, in spite of differences in, in our colour, uh, and, and, you know, uh, uh, on ongoing jokes against the French. Uh, but, you know, there are some nice Frenchmen as well. But anyway, the, uh, leave that aside. Uh, I think, I've heard. Uh, anyway, I like I like that guy Dupartou, Dupart what's his name? Dupartou, Dupartou. Uh, he's uh, a good guy. Uh, anyway, please remember the name of the first city they visited on Cyprus, Salamis, because the island of Cyprus had a shape similar to a salamander shape. <laughs> okay, oh, that's what they're saying. Uh, so they're going to the... Um, let me go back a little bit, uh, because I had a little bit in here before. But I've misplaced it, okay. Um, Solution. I had a little bit on the uh, on the distance from it was about 16 miles from where they started off uh, to where they're going to. Uh, okay, that's starting to sell us. I've got another bit here. Just talk among yourselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right, Seleucia was uh, 16 miles away. Um, destination that we're going to was Cyprus. They arrived at the port of Salamis on the east coast. This is, of course, familiar down to Barnabas because he was born on the island of Cyprus. Okay? Uh, we, we call uh, uh, Cyprus the Happy Isle. Or from the word, uh, if you look in uh, the Beatitudes, happy, be uh, blessed is the man, Macarius, and uh, happy is the man who allows God to work his life like that, okay? So, the Happy Isle. Uh, and then it says, when he got to the Happy Isle, uh, the Feast of War in the Jewish synagogues. Now, when you think about it, that's, uh, that's an important element. And it's an element that turns up time and time again in, in the Apostle Paul. Because of his situation, he'd been taught under Gamaliel. He was a very clever man. He was well respected in Jewish circles before he became a Christian. Of course, they... They thought something a bit different about him once he did become a Christian, but he was a very important, influential man. But he took the ability, uh, uh, took the opportunity everywhere he went, at first of all, giving the, the Jews the opportunity of hearing the gospel. Uh, and I get the impression that he stayed there long enough in these synagogues until eventually they kicked him out. Uh, but when they kicked him out, like we're going to see later on in this chapter, he often took a bunch of people with him. So he got the opportunity to speak, and he made the best of that opportunity. Um, when you think about it, the gospel 
talking about Jesus, Jesus was a Jew. Jesus came from a Jewish heritage. The Jews should have been looking for the Messiah and therefore should have been open to the message of the Gospel. And therefore for, to go to them first, to give them the opportunity first, uh, is not only uh, sensible, but it gives you an audience. It, it should be uh, at least uh, open at least to some of the arguments uh, about who Jesus was. And in some cases they were successful, in other cases they weren't. Uh, and as you see the, the uh, mystery journeys continue, you're going to find that uh, a number of Jews are very antagonistic towards the Apostle Paul. So much so that wherever he goes, they follow deliberately to cause trouble. And quite often he, he, he escapes with skin of his teeth out of some places because these people are, are really uh, vicious. Uh, and they want to control the Apostle Paul, they want to stop the gospel being preached, uh, and they do that to the best of their ability, and often it's Paul that uh, gets it in the neck as they go on. Uh, in some cases, left for dead, if you read that Second uh, Corinthians a list of the things he went through, the amount of times he was beaten, etc. Uh, it's, it's quite uh, interesting. So, uh, it goes from uh, Cyprus, Salamis, proclaimed the gospel in Jewish synagogues, uh, and uh, uh, that's uh, the back on there. Go to the next one. Uh, this is uh, obviously some of the places that he would have been uh, a little bit, uh, he wouldn't have open air meeting, we would call today, but it wasn't obviously open air back then. Uh, it was quite an important place to be. So this is a seaport in northern Syria, Paul and Barnum's and John Mark and Bart from Cyprus from here. The scientific name for copper is cuprium, related to the Greek word for Cyprus. Uh, Cupros. Cyprus was an abundant source of copper in ancient times. It's also noticed, uh, noted as, the, as it's the birthplace of Aphrodite, uh, uh, Latin Venus Greek myth of Greek mythology. Um, a, according to Greek legend, uh, Aphrodite was said to have been born from the foam of the sea and gently floated in a seashell to Cyprus, where she made her home. Okay? Very, uh, very impressive. Beautiful. I sat, I sat. On the you, and you've obviously been affected very much by, beauty. by yeah, the beauty of, of uh, her area. Okay. Another Greek legend said that Pygmalion, another guy who's quite famous, uh, king of Cyprus, made an ivory statue of a beautiful woman, so beautiful mm. that he fell in love with it and asked Venus to bring it to life, mm. which she did. He married the former statue and became the father of Paphos. Today, Paphos is a very popular holiday destination, which some here can uh, attest to, uh, because there's lots of Roman amphitheaters and a very impressive Roman villa, uh, which was there at the time of the resident Roman, uh, well, we're going to come across later, Sergius Paulus, as his name is. Just, uh, okay, let me just see, I think I've got some more about Sergius Paulus here. Hebrew name was Kitten, for which the Hebrew got the word for islands, coastal countries, and inhabitants around the Mediterranean Sea. Okay, when they ran to Salmis to proclaim the word of God in the Jewish synagogue, John was with them as a helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. That's a better map for you, Frank. Yes, okay. it is. Now watch this. This is, this is technology in action. You see that little <laughs> thing? You blinked, didn't you? Yeah. You missed it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Look, look, there you go. See? Let's go again. All right? There's more to come. Anyway, uh, so here's the har uh, modern day harbour at uh, Paphos. Mm -hmm. They travelled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. Then they met a Jewish sorcerer and a false prophet named Bar Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elamas, the sorcerer, for that's what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from his faith. I don't know how many of you saw Alexander the Great uh, on TV last week. Uh, but uh, before he went to the battle, or before he did anything, he used to always go and, and uh, seek the oracle, see what the oracle says. We've got a lot of people who do that on Saturday morning, looking for the, the, the racing tips in the afternoon, you know, see what the cinema stars, you know, put up a load of money. But there's a lot of people today who subconsciously perhaps, or whether consciously, treat the, the horoscopes in the, in, the, in the newspapers just as people in those days used to treat the oracle at Delphi. And if you're really serious about it, uh, what do you have to do? You, you put some money in an envelope and, and actually contact one of these, and they'll write you your own star uh, chart. Uh, it's, it's about 200 years out of date, but that's the material. Uh, they'll take your money anyway. Uh, but this is, uh, you think that's a, you know, 
And, and today we wouldn't be su as superstitious uh, as these people way back then. But it, the, the, the reality is it's always been there. Uh, uh, there's always been, matter of fact, when you think, was it George Bush Sr.? Oh no, R uh, Richard Reagan. Uh, Richard Reagan? Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. <laughs> uh, he, he had a, an astrologer. He wouldn't do anything at a specific day because the astrologer said it's not a good day. I don't think any days are good for him. But anyway, uh, she must have had some right out of all the time she spent with him. But uh, here's a, even in our day, here's a, a, a world leader who still mm -hmm. seeks the oracle. And if you go to uh, uh, Japan and China and places like that, uh, that, is, that is the way of life. I mean, they, they, uh, I think in China, number eight is the, uh, the good day. So uh, if, if you do anything on the, uh, within eight of the month, then things are going to be good for you. Uh, what happens to the rest of the month, I don't know. But anyway, um, it's, it's still a thing. It's still a regular thing. And here we saw uh, this situation where uh, here's a man of power, and around him are special people who would uh, give advice. Uh, they would be very clever people because they have to be clever because they give the wrong advice, they end up losing their heads. Um, maybe you should think way back into uh, the book of Daniel. Uh, that was what Daniel was up against. When the king had his dream, he says, Okay, what's the dream mean? So the guy said, Well, give us a clue. What was the dream about? And they said, No, 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 this time I'm not going to tell you anything. And they had to come up with what was in his mind and they couldn't do it. And then Daniel came along uh, and he told them. God told uh, through Daniel what the king's dream was. That gives a, if, if it's always been said, if you go to some of these people, if you don't give them any information, it's very difficult for them to give you any uh, real details. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you start talking, you're in trouble because they pick up stuff all the time. Anyway, let's say uh, uh, Sergius <coughs> Proconsul is called. Pontius Pilate was a, a governor of Judea at the same time as a, uh, uh, was a, pro a procurator. And that tells us how the Roman authorities regarded Cyprus on the one hand and Judea on the other. A, procur a procur procurator <laughs> was by, uh, appointed by a Roman, governor, a Roman emperor himself and remained in office just as long as the emperor wanted him there. Furthermore, it was usually an appointment to a territory which was considered hard to govern and control, which therefore needed a strong hand. A proconsul, on the other hand, was appointed by the Roman Senate, and it was usually an annual or perhaps biannual appointment. What made it an attractive posting was that a proconsul was appointed where people were not giving too much trouble. So it was an easy post, you could say. So here at Paphos, uh, when the missionaries met the man, Elam, Elam, Elamas, who ex exerted a strange influence on the Sergius Paulus, when Sergius Paulus sent for Barnabas, Silas, the magician, didn't want uh, to know. Now, against the background of that, you know, I need to understand that, that Elamas was actually a Jew. So being a Jew, he would have been understood the Jewish faith. But against the teaching of the Jewish faith, he decided to go into this sideline of, of um, sorcery, you know, magic and stuff like that, of conning people, making his living on a different area. Now, in the Jewish faith in Deuteronomy, that's condemned. So he is against the, these missionaries on two counts. He doesn't even know about the Christianity side, but the very fact that the Jews coming to talk to his leader, and the fact that his leader is willing to uh, listen to them, uh, puts his position under threat because uh, he knows that whatever they're bringing, message they're bringing, it's going to be bad news for him. Uh, and so against that background, um, he's, been, he's been using his powers, uh, obviously, to make money. Uh, and you'd think sometimes that intelligent people wouldn't be stuck then. I don't know how many of you watch regularly some of these uh, magicians, street magicians that we have on TV these days. And I'll tell you, they're magic, aren't they? It's all, you know it's all tricks. But it still takes you in all the same. Yeah? It's, they're, they're pretty good at what they do. And uh, that's why they're called magicians, I suppose. Mm. So, so this man, uh, Elemas, uh, he's got a couple of problems because he, he claims to be a prophet, but he's actually a false prophet. Uh, and when, uh, he would be, under the Hebrew religion, he would be stoned for being a false prophet, okay? So, um, really, uh, he should have known better, but he didn't. Let me see if I can get you a bit more exciting. Okay, uh, verse 9, which is somewhere in the next uh, uh, verse. Oops. Sorcerer and false prophet, Bar Jesus, son of Joshua and Aramaic, false cult, Elemis from the Hebrew word, Arabic, Arabic word, wise man or magician. The Greek equivalent would be magi, or magus, or magician, okay? 
the wise men who visited Jesus in his infancy were called this by this name, and Daniel also uh, had been one in Babylon. Do you see any resemblance here between uh, the Simon and sorcerers? Do you remember far back as Acts chapter 8? I would remember this earlier on part of this year, where uh, Peter had a run in with a sorcerer and he sorted him out. So uh, mm -hmm. it's interesting, there's a lot of them about, and, uh, and there a lot of them would be against the Christian faith. Uh, and therefore, they would, they would come into uh, real conflict between the Christians and these uh, men who are making a living. Uh, a little bit later on, you're going to hear about the silversmith. Uh, and he also has got a few uh, problems with Christianity. If anything affects your pocket, you tend to be rather vo uh, vocal about <laughs> whoever's doing that. Uh, and Christianity would affect these people's pockets, and therefore uh, you're hitting them in the heart, really. And so you can ask you to the study of Paulus, and from the moment on, Saul himself is called uh, Paulus in the Greek. Okay, good map. They travelled through the whole island to the King Pathos. I've done that. All right. I've done that. No, I, should, I should scrub that one out. Yeah. Oh, this is for this reason. Okay. Uh, we've got a, a very famous writer called Ramsey. Uh, and until he really came on the scene, I mean, he's, he's been dead now for years, isn't he? Last century, he does. Last, yes. <laughs> uh, but before he came, he came on the scene, the Bible, by a lot of people for about a hundred odd years, was really put in disrepute. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, it's full of mistakes. Ah, oh, you can't believe what the Bible says. Uh, you know, and historically, it's inaccurate. Uh, and all this type of stuff is going on. And against that background, uh, Ramsey comes into his own. So this, uh, this is a quote uh, from a guy called Gildon Hughes, uh, or whatever, from probably Dutch extraction. As recently as 1902, one sake I believe that the historical vacuum of acts shrinks until it reaches a vanishing point. He says, historically, Acts is just rubbish. It's not accurate at all. As a matter of fact, you'd have to look hard to find anything accurate in it. But this was current philosophy about 18th century. Okay? The two beginning school, which is basically a bunch of people who, who tore the Bible apart, couldn't be, figure it out to put it back together again, they were all the rage in Germany. And they affected a lot of uh, uh, biblical thinking. As a matter of fact, their thinking is still a priority uh, in our universities today. They still have a huge impact on our, how our universities see the Bible and theology. Uh, there was a friend of mine, he, he went to a, a, a Oxford University, uh, and there were about 13 people uh, went with him in, in his class, into a class on theology, which is basically about biblical stuff. And 13 of them believed in the Bible when they went in, and by the time his 18 month course was, uh, uh, was up, there was only him still believing in the Bible. So they went in there to, to get the Bible expounded, they tore it apart, couldn't figure it out, couldn't put it together again, and so 12 out of the 13 uh, no longer accept the Bible as historical today. That's, that's almost, you could say, typical of many of our universities today. Okay, so this is the, the school of thought that was uh, really instrumental in, in affecting the, the way that uh, British universities uh, thought. These books are without any value except for the we sections and acts. The no value, don't bother with Acts, it's not worth looking at, okay? That's what he said. But then popped on the scene this guy, William Ramsey. Now he was of the same opinion. Uh, and he decided to, to go to uh, uh, Palestine and have a look for himself, to back up what he basically thought and had been taught by these people and, and others like them. Uh, and so he was technically, you could say, almost an unbeliever when he first went out. He was going to, he was going to show these biblical people the rubbish that they believed in. Okay, that's how he basically started off. But he was so impressed with the book, uh, with Luke that uh, it changed that around. Golden Hughes goes on, toward the end of the last century though, and during the first part of the present century, they set the researches of men like Ramsey, Harnack, and Hawkins brought to light masses of surprising facts that confirmed the historical accuracy of the statements of Luke, <coughs> which were formally condemned as fictitious. Okay? From this point on, uh, the Bible was seen, it's not talking a lot of rubbish. Uh, I, I, when I, in my youth, which is a long time ago, I used to read cowboy books. My father used to read them, I used to get them after him. And there was one particular cowboy writer that it said in the, in the forefront, it said, if he tells you there's a stream there, he says there will be a stream there. If he talks about a, a bluff or a escarpment, he says there will be one there. That same confidence is what Luke inspired in people like Ramsey. 
if Luke says something, you can be uh, guaranteed that that is there. Yeah, Rummers has spent 20 years doing that. Yeah. And his conclusion was that all the titles, all the offices, all the referen ge geographical right. references were absolutely correct. <coughs> and in keeping with the age. It's very difficult also because for us, looking back <coughs> historically, it kind of merges into one, one uh, big you know, mess, if you like. But if you think even now in our day, for example, Rutland. You could have written a letter a couple of years ago to somebody in Australia and said, Rutland is no longer a county, it's mm -hmm. Leicester. Mm -hmm. But if you were to write the letter a couple of years before that, you'd be able to say, Rutland is a county. And if you write a couple of years after that, you say, Rutland as a county. But if you wrote that letter at that particular time when it wasn't the county, then people looking back would say, that's rubbish, Rutland is not Rutland, it's a county. But knowing the historical fact, you would know that for a short period in our history, mm -hmm. Rutland actually disappeared as a county mm -hmm. and then came back in. And that's the kind of thing that often was seen, somebody was maybe named, and some of you say, oh, no, no, he, he, he didn't reign around that time. Or, or he, didn't, he wasn't king at this particular time in, in history. Uh, and, and they would say it's a biblical mistake. But Ramsey and his research and people like Ramsey showed that if Luke said somebody reigned when he did, then he did. And you could have confidence in what he had to say. So uh, where a lot of people thought is the Bible, even today we talk to people and people say, ah, oh, you don't believe that rubbish. The Bible? <laughs> That's all that, isn't it? It's, it's, you can't call it historical. Uh, but in reality, these men who spent the time with it demonstrated yes and was. Uh, in a little bit of conclusion, the consequence, a complete changeover has been brought about in historians' opinions regarding the historical trustworthiness of Luke. After doing research work for many years, 20 years, in the regions described by Luke, Ramsey stated unambiguously, and other big words like that, <laughs> he says, Luke's writing is unsurpassed in respect of his trustworthiness. You can trust what Luke has said, which gives us confidence. Summing up, he wrote, Luke is a historian of the first rank. Not merely are his statements trustworthy, he is possessed of the true historic sense. Mm -hmm. In short, this author should be ranked along with the very greatest of historians. Okay? So that's uh, a back, part in the back for Luke. These words are important coming as you, not from an apologist or a theologian, but from a recognized authority in archaeology. That's this guy, uh, Golden Hughes. Okay. So, whenever modern scholarship has been able to check up on the accuracy of Luke, the judgment has been unanimous. He is one of the finest and ablest historians in the ancient world. Okay. Hmm. <coughs> when Saul was also called Paul, so was the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elam, Elam, Elamus and said, you are a child of the devil, an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceits and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? And the hand of the Lord is against you. You're going to be blind for a time, and you'll be unable to see the light of the sun. So it's almost here uh, poetic justice, in a way. Uh, it's interesting, as part of this, uh, he's almost saying here, uh, will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? He's, he's indicating that he understands Elamis' Jewish background. And he, he basically is saying, Elamis, you should know better when are you are going to stop abusing the knowledge that you have. Uh, and this is uh, really quite powerful, because this has been, this, uh, Elamis has been this man's right, this, this uh, ruler's right-hand man for quite a while, and, and, and somebody that he would trust in. Uh, and here he is, uh, Paul looks him, right in the eye. A lot of us, or some of us, might be tempted to talk about somebody behind their back. It's a lot easier to do. That wasn't Paul's style. Okay, Paul says to his face, and I would imagine, not just by himself, I would imagine in a, a public scenario. He's, he's, if this is, this is a gunfight at noon, and a, you know, the OK Corral, this is uh, one man looking honestly in the eyes of the other and saying, you are a tricker. You are a deceit. You are uh, perverting the right ways of the Lord. Now what are you going to do about it? I'll tell you what I'm going to do about it. I, because of God, I'm going to blind you for a short period. 
Now, this is interesting also because it's the first time in the Bible, in the New Testament, that we see, a, a, if you like, a miraculous event on a negative. Here is someone not given sight, but sight taken away from him. Now, some people could say, well, it's because he maybe wasn't physically sick, but he was spiritually sick, and he needed somebody to waken him up. Uh, and, and, uh, but the other factor involved in this, this is a miracle that's done, but the impact of the miracle is what gives the miracle even more strength. Uh, obviously, it shows mercifully uh, Paul could have uh, blinded the man for life, but he didn't. He said, just for a short time. And that's always uh, also reminiscent of what happened to him. Uh, he more or less came to his senses when he lost his sight, uh, and he started asking the right questions and said what he'd been doing up to then, assuming that the Christians were, were a false religion. Okay? Uh, and now here's Elimus being given a taste of what the Apostle Paul had gone through. <clears throat> I'll leave you to answer that yourselves. Okay? Others opposed the gospel that had not been struck blind. Why strike a sorcerer blind? This man was uh, claimed to do lots of different things. Whether he'd been claimed, uh, he'd also claimed to heal people and he hadn't been able to do it, I don't know. Might be something in the background <coughs> of that. And it's the other one, uh, it's significant that Paul was involved when this man could see himself went through something similar. Um, okay. Good question. Missionaries are often classed as really the new cultural imperialists, okay? Sometimes when we bring the gospel to, to some places, they're, they're not very happy with uh, uh, the impact, but more of that, the social people. Uh, we, 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 when, when the gospel first, first went to some of the islands, uh, and uh, sometimes the missionaries got a bit too enthusiastic, and obviously perhaps the natives were uh, a little bit more native than the, the, the people wanted them to be. So the next thing they had, you had everybody was fully clothed and wear a shirt and tie in order to uh, uh, <coughs> conform to their type of Christianity impact. And sometimes Christianity has done that in times past, where they've, we have bludgeoned in, if you like, and, and tried to force a culture to change certain areas where it didn't need to change. Of course, if in, like in Papua New Guinea, one of the, the pastime is if you, you go off and you eat one of your husbands, uh, at a party, I mean, you know, some of these things uh, should be stopped. But there's other things perhaps we've done, we've gone overboard on. Uh, and that has got, brought its own uh, 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 undesirable impacts. But Christianity is blamed sometimes for changing too much of people's cultures, for imposing on them a message that they don't deserve or whatever. And you call these people, or the, the people who talk about this, you use a special word, okay? A cultural group, it says, develops its local story or a kind of world. So it's saying, before Christianity goes into somewhere, the local indigenous population will have an idea or a story of where they came from, what they're doing, where they're going. For example, in Australia, the Aborigines talk about um, Australia being the, be the beginning place of the Australian people, the Aborig or local Aborigine. And there are all sorts of cultural things that they hang on to as an oral tradition of that. But we know that the Aborigines came from India by genetically following the, uh, the genetic trail. You, you, can, you can follow them through uh, Indonesia back out through into India. So their local history or local story of how they began is out of the, out of the earth of, of, of Australia. But in actual fact, uh, historically, we know that's not true. So, but they do have a, a local account of the world. So the they Christians, dutifully they say, our, our people who are against Christ, uh, say, you guys come along and you will impose your Christianity upon these other people, crushing other local stories in the process. And they call this the meta-narrative. So Christianity comes on, and no matter what stories they have, we take over and we then control them and manipulate them, they say. Okay? Well, that's not quite the, the Christian uh, concept. Uh, we have, in actual fact, God claiming to have revealed where we come from, what we're doing, and where we're going. And because it comes from the Creator, not from us, we're only passing on the message of the Creator, then when we talk to people, it is still a meta-narrative, but 
we are bringing a message that reveals a truth from the ultimate creator. That's our, if you like, our high ground, moral high ground. It doesn't give us the right to walk all over the culture, but it means we're bringing a message, not our message, and imposing our message on others, but the message of God. Uh, we're sharing with others. Enlightening would be a better word. So where the uh, enemies of Christianity see us as coming in and browbeating people to uh, accept a message that they ought not to accept because they've already got a message, uh, our, our angle, if you like, is saying, look, God has spoken, and this is what he said, therefore, um, and in some cases, like the Australian situation, we can know that their own meta-narrative and their own story is, is not good uh, by the genetic or you know, my Christianity. Okay? So we're not, rather than coming in and doing damage, uh, we're doing something different. The other factor, uh, we think of Elimus and his mates as being a, a first century, second century phenomenon. No, there's still illnesses around today. Uh, as religious faith or fake healers, false, and pro false prophets, still prevent the right ways of the Lord. We can see them practically every week on TV. There's a brilliant guy on at the moment. I almost feel like kicking the, the TV in every time I see him. Uh, the mess he must, the destruction he must leave behind is always unbelievable. Anyway, he looks, seems quite popular. Uh, as fake both methods of modern day illnesses are the same as Balaam's at the end. And that is money and power, and that's why they keep giving us your pennies. Okay? It used to be, uh, when I was in Scalmers Jail, he used to be a popular guy. He says, put your hand on the TV, uh, and uh, you'll, you'll get your healing or whatever. And even better, if you send us a, a, a few bob, they'll send you a little bit green handkerchief, and you put that on whatever it's sell, and you'll be all right. As a matter of fact, there's somebody in, uh, I think it's from Stanton, used to do that regularly. So you could pop over there and buy a box supply. Uh, anyway, uh, as Paul said, if anyone listened to an angel who spoke a message different from the written gospel, that he would be a curse. That's pretty strong language. But the Galatian writer, Paul writing to Galatia, he says, look, there is only one gospel message. And we need, to, we need to make sure that we are proclaiming that one gospel message. And if we're not, we need to get our act together. Okay, we have no right to impose on others something that's false. So uh, I need to check what I'm saying, you need to check what you're hearing, and you need to check what you're saying, because the onus is on you before God. Graham, um, I watched uh, that Jeremy Cow show, right? And there was three people on it, right? They were part of this religious thing and that, right? And uh, what they were saying, right, was right, from what I've learned, yeah, but they were saying it in a wrong way, no, no, like in uh, saying, people only brought up uh, the, the child, the son of the devil, and all that. No, in that kind of way, you no, know, because he went out to war and all that kind of stuff. But just in the wrong kind of way they were saying it. But what they were saying, why was right in no in biblical terms. You know what I mean? Okay. It's very, very difficult. I mean. There's loads of instances, and we had, if we had more time, we could we spend more, more time with it, but we don't. But the, um, there's loads of instances, there was one instance where I, I won a big faith healing meeting. There was uh, cameras on the guy on stage. There was also unknown to him, a hidden camera, that was in the, one of the back rooms. And when people uh, lined up to come into this big, there was a big, a couple of thousand pe uh, people uh, who were there. They all used to sign cards, you know, who they were, why they'd come, uh, what was wrong with them and stuff like that. And all these cards, unknown to the individuals at the, at the uh, uh, front, uh, went into a, a card file index. And when the guy was on stage, the guy at the back was radio controlled through to his earpiece. And he would say, there's a guy here, Fred, uh, and he's got such and such. And the guy would, you know, there's something out there, something in the book. And even when the video was taken round to these people's homes, they wouldn't believe that they were being caught. Mm -hmm. It's very, very strong stuff. If you really want to believe that, mm -hmm. it's very strong stuff. So Elemis was in his element. Elemis was in element, but Paul sort of the mate. Okay? Uh, this idea here, uh, believe that, if anyone listens to an angel who spoke a message different from written in the gospel, it would be a cost. Um, Islam began uh, when the claims that the prophet made that God spoke to him through angels. 
uh, and I'll show you what the Islam movement began. And uh, Mormonism, uh, a man with a special stone, this angel Moroni would, would reveal uh, a new gospel to them. And that's where Mormonism came from. It's a very dangerous uh, 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 situation. Um, and, uh, you know, it's something that's it's not new, it's around, it's been around for a long time, and no doubt there'll be many more to come. Uh, <coughs> Chapter uh, 39, rather, immediately mist and darkness came over, over Elamis and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. There's two things in that verse. Mm. When the proconsul saw what had happened to Elamis, he saw a miraculous thing. And then he believed, for he was amazed about the teaching of the Lord. Mm. All the way in the New Testament, when it talks about miracles happening, the miracles are not an end product in themselves. The miracles are meant to make you stop and think and even ask questions <coughs> and be taught, put you in a frame of mind to be taught the right thing. And that's exactly what you had here. Uh, the proconsul was amazed at what he saw and that made him take time to listen carefully to the apostle's message. And when he did, uh, then he was convinced by that. So therefore, You've got a, a proper use of a miracle. Miracles are not meant to be one-offs for no reason. They're meant to confirm a message or to put you in a frame of mind where you're receptive to the message. And the message must be consistent with the message uh, that's been revealed by the Holy Spirit in time past. The Holy Spirit doesn't change his mind all that often. Okay? So, um, uh, you could ask yourself the question, was, was the good... Uh, you know, did Paul do the right thing to poor old Elymas? Um, well, uh, he certainly probably had pulled the wool over a lot of people's eyes, uh, blinded them uh, uh, spiritually in times past. So uh, it was an eye opener for him to be blind. Okay. Was that what, what, what effect did it have on. And the question is, I mean, it, was Paul right in, in, in actually blinding someone. Remember uh, Jesus at one time, uh, a, the, the disciple, a couple of disciples were a bit unhappy about a particular situation. He said, why don't you bring down fire and brimstone? You know, you know sort them out. They're not nice people. Uh, and Jesus wouldn't do that. Um, so here's Paul using something like this, blindness. Would it be, was it uh, appropriate? Well, when you think about the blindness that Elamis had been inflicting by his deceit, on people's lives for quite a number of years, making a good living out of it, it's probably fitting for him to be blinded physically for a short period uh, in order to make him see the effects of his life. But it, it showed the proconsul there was a greater power than Elimus. Yes, no matter what Elimus could do, there was somebody who could do even more. Mm. Did, it, was, did it have a profound effect on it had on, 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 on both. On, we don't hear about Elamis anymore. Yeah, no, but uh, having said that, uh, it certainly had an impact on a proconsul picked his ears up to listen carefully to what uh, Paul, uh, Paul and uh, Barnabas had to say, and therefore uh, it, certainly, it, it, had its, it did its job. Mm -hmm. I, I told you about that one earlier, yes. so I'm going to leave that one. <laughs> okay. Ruins of ancient Perga. We'll stop. I think I, I, my clock's a bit slow, so I'll stop here. We'll stop at number stop here. From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga and Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. <coughs> That's the conflict you're talking about. Um, now, there's lots of arguments, if that's a good one, uh, as to why John left. Uh, one of the strongest elements that somebody puts forward is, is that he was just homesick. Uh, and that's why when John does go, he didn't go back to Antioch. It goes back to Jerusalem. John Mark, remember, he, he had quite a, an influential family in Jerusalem. And uh, the implication is that up to now, he thought possibly that this is going to be the furthest they were going to go. Uh, and as they, they got further and further away from home, he gets more and more homesick until he gets so homesick. The next thing that, that uh, Paul's going to be uh, asked him to do is climb over a mountain range. Uh, and that's not a, you know, you're talking about hundreds of miles, uh, or a hundred, hundred odd miles, uh, and that's not going to be easy travelling. He's a poor homesick lad, first time maybe away from his, uh, his family, and he's thinking to himself, you know, 
I, what am I doing here? I need to know. So this is uh, John goes back. Uh, and Paul sees it as, you know, he's let the side there. We've got enough problems, we've got enough big, in, the, the job's big enough as it is. Uh, some people would say that, uh, because of Paul's comment in one of the other uh, letters he writes, that he didn't baptize a lot of people physically. Uh, and they think that John was, was the guy, Paul would do the preaching, and John would be one of the guys who was seen to the, the physical thing. Whether that's true or not, we don't know. But um, basically, he leaves them here, and there's a, a couple of different reasons why he might have left. And we'll come back mm. to verse 14 uh, next week.